a sow stomach, a woman's soul, and the contents of a sausage. In the beginning was an empty stomach and an urge to survive. Hunters didn't bring home fresh meat every day, so to ensure a regular supply of protein, many civilians came up with methods of preserving food. A long time before we had freezers. In the past, food went off within a few days because of the rival intervention of bacteria, fungi, flies or other organisms. To beat that competition, meat was cured in brine or hung up in the chimney. The first method slowed down microbial growth, the second sealed the outer layer of the meat, keeping microorganisms at bay. The earliest references to sausage making date back to 500 BC to ancient Greece, where someone had the the idea of wrapping meat in a goat's stomach. We learned a great deal from them in the past. And then they added spices. Spices are not only good because they make food tasty, most of them also have bactericidal or fungicidal effects. The methods used to preserve meat were refined over the centuries. Today, heirs to generations of craft skill produce delicacies that are guaranteed to make mouth water, like Wiener Weinschinken, a succulent smoked ham on the bone. But there's more to an animal than just legs. Ham is one of the most expensive parts of a pig. It's made from the hind leg and only the hind leg. But, when the leg is trimmed, other parts are left over, and they're used for making sausage. In the past, especially during the post-war years, every scrap of meat was used, every bone picked clean. Today, better meat is used. A Frankfurter Wurst today may have sirloin in it, but it could also contain boiling beef. So sausage meat comes from the same animal, just not the leg. The basic recipe for most sausages is very simple. Beef, pork fat, seasonings, a few tricks of the trade. And ice. The ice helps draw gelatine out of the meat and bind the protein. And it's not the only secret involved in ensuring the right texture. Vienna's butchers don't use chemical additives to extend the shelf life of their products. They don't need to. Their products fly off the shelf. But they do pay close attention to the ratio of ingredients. Every butcher has his own recipe and each swears by his own spice mix. Consumer preference is naturally a factor, but the first determinant is whether the butcher likes it because he's the first to taste it. Like a cook, the butcher uses, and experiments with, a whole range of herbs and spices. He may also add pumpkin seeds and cheese to the mix or decide on paprika flakes for extra heat. Butchers are proud of their recipes and wouldn't disclose them for the world. They're handed down from father to son, a closely guarded secret, especially the seasoning. The seasoned meat goes into the casing. This is Wiener Extrawurst, a kind of luncheon meat. The casings used for the large sausages for slicing are not edible. They're plastic. 
Frankfurter casing is made from the small intestines of sheep, but not local sheep. Their intestines tear too easily. These come from sheep that live in hotter climes. The Frankfurter is now nearly finished. But what about the color? And what does a Frankfurter have in common with Wiener Weinschinken? But first we clear up the question of the name. Why is a Wiener in Vienna called a Frankfurter? It goes back to a man called Johann Georg Lahner, who was born in 1772 and trained as a butcher in Frankfurt am Main. When he qualified as a journeyman butcher, he took to the road and ended up in Vienna. He arrived in the city in 1798 and was taken on by a local butcher. A few years later, with the savings he'd built up and with a loan from a rich baroness, he was able to set up his own business. And on those premises, on the 15th of May, 1805, he created the recipe for the Frankfurter sausage. He called it a Frankfurter because he learned his trade in Frankfurt. But others, of course, said it was a Viennese invention, which is why the rest of the world calls it a Wiener. Johann Georg Lahner's invention took Vienna by storm. A handy bite for any time of day, it also made a quick hot meal for surprise guests. The world's first snack product was born. The history books also tell of a centuries-old dispute between two professions, meat smokers and meat butchers. From time immemorial, Vienna's trade regulations had fueled conflict even outright war between the guilds. Peace did not come until 1936, when the regulations were reformed and the two professions merged. It's reported that the emperor himself was partial to a breakfast of Venus and beer. What is not clear is how the emperor ate the new speciality. At banquets, polite society was not at all sure how to tackle a Frankfurter sausage. It was not yet covered by the rules of etiquette. It was Princess Paulina Metternich who showed society how it's done. She simply walked up, reached in with her hand, picked out a pair of sausages, pulled them apart and took a bite. Eaten by hand, made by hand. As with all craft products, there are differences in shape and size. No two Frankfurters are alike. Like Beinschinken, Frankfurters are smoked. For 8,000 years, this method has been used to extract moisture slowly and evenly from meat. It also adds flavor and gives the meat an appetizing color. Achieving the perfect balance between fat and water content to ensure that the meat remains succulent takes a trained eye and experience. One minute longer or shorter in the oven can crucially affect the flavor. The butcher defines the direction. Easy on the smoke because we don't want it to mask the flavor of the meat. A Knackwurst or Frankfurter should taste meaty when you bite into it. If it does, the butcher's got it right. It's an art. Just as a chef in a restaurant masters the art of seasoning, a butcher develops an instinct, a feel for the right mix. You feel you've created something. It's the right size, the right color and perfectly seasoned. It's not just a product, it's a source of pride. Color and flavor are now just right. So it's time for a bath. 10 to 12 minutes in hot, not boiling water. The temperature is kept at exactly 72 degrees Celsius. Quality controllers look over the butcher's shoulder at every stage. 
In Vienna, they're known collectively as the Sausage Parliament. The product is now left to cool, not in cold but in lukewarm water. This ensures that the casing pops when it's bitten into. Anyone who buys sausage from a Vienna butcher can rest assured that it contains nothing that shouldn't be there. If you look in here, you won't see the bottom because it's a soup, a beef soup. It's important that it shouldn't boil but just simmer. But the most important thing about it is that it contains different kinds of sausage which add different flavours. Here, for example, I have a spicy Bohrenwurst, frankfurters, a normal Bohrenwurst, a garlic sausage and a double-smoked Waldviertel. Together, they produce an overall flavour, especially the Bohrenwurst, which is not closed at the ends, so the flavour travels through it. It's ready when it almost comes apart. Where does the name come from? I think it dates from around 1800 when the mix was baked in a round form that made it look like a cheese. So the Germans called it Leberkäse. Leberkäse is not the only type of sausage that gets its name from its shape, not its contents. The hot dog, a symbol of global Americanization and the main subject of this video installation by Austrian media artist Chili Gallai. Picking up the traces of the American pop art propagated by Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein, Gallai reflects on familiar, everyday things and uses them to make the mechanisms of advertising art transparent. The hot dog is closely linked with Viennese butchery tradition. Inside is a frankfurter, and the bread roll was the idea of a great-grandson of the frankfurter's inventor. He migrated to America in the 19th century and made a living selling ice cream at sporting events. The day before a baseball match, the temperature plummeted and it was obvious that nobody was going to buy ice cream. But Lana's great-grandson was a clever character. Remembering the Wiener Würstchen from home, he set about making an alternative product. He cut bread rolls down the middle, placed the sausage inside and coated it with mustard. The sausage was hot and went down very well at the match. And he called it something like a sausage in a blanket. Und das Würstel war natürlich im heißen Zustand und das ist natürlich sehr gut angekommen bei diesem bei diesem Spiel. But at some point he met a sports reporter who said the shape reminded him of a dog, a Dachshund. So because it was hot, it became a hot dog. Und und weil das noch dazu heiß war, hat er dann gesagt Hot Dog. Fat is essential not just in the frying pan, but also in the sausage-making process. Butchers speak of visible and invisible fat. But either way, there is a biochemical link between fat and the flavor of a sausage. Fat is the number one flavor carrier. We need fat. Meat doesn't have much flavour, so a sausage without seasoning wouldn't taste very good. To get seasoning to the palate, you need fat, which is a very good flavour preserver. It's what makes a sausage tasty. Good quality meat needs to contain a certain amount of fat. Fats are particularly good at storing energy for emergencies. They also form part of essential bodily structures such as membranes. Without them, the human body couldn't function. So weight problems don't only come from a high-fat diet. They come from the fact that we eat far more than our body actually needs. So the contents of a sausage are not a mystery. Analysis of the composition of sausage meat and the quality of the protein it delivers is a subject of serious scientific study. But laboratories are also looking for new and improved products. In Germany, one line of research aims at producing a sausage with 2% fat. 
Das geht nicht. It's not possible, it won't work. It's better to have a bit of fat and space meals evenly throughout the day. That's the answer. Austria has optimal conditions for free-range animal husbandry. Nearly 60% of agricultural land is pasture. There's plenty of space for grazing exercise and social contact. Butchers and consumers have realized that this form of livestock farming also makes for better flavored meat. Smaller farms in particular are adopting practices that are more appropriate for the species, turning away from intensive livestock farming and controversial genetic engineering towards farming that's good for the environment and sustainable in the future because attitudes to meat consumption have changed. Critical questions are raised. Indeed, there's even heated debate about what we should and shouldn't eat. In the media today, we hear some very controversial opinions about meat consumption, claims that it's dangerous to eat meat, that there are substances in it that are bad for us. But there's no sound scientific evidence to support such claims. It's fair enough to argue that it's not possible to supply everyone with meat from organically farmed animals. There are too many people in the world for that. But there are no grounds for thinking that there's something in meat that is harmful to human beings anzunehmen, dass im Fleisch irgendetwas enthalten ist, was dem menschlichen Körper schadet. The important thing is how meat was produced, but the number of people who can tell us that is decreasing. The last 50 years have seen the closure of nine out of ten butchers shops. Nevertheless, now is a good opportunity to reverse that trend. It depends on the consumer. The consumer decides the future of the butcher on the corner who processes and sells locally produced meat. The local supplier should naturally be supported. As in an election, consumers vote every day for their suppliers, for small shopkeepers and for other types of retailer. At the top of the market in particular, we find more and more customers attaching importance to quality and being prepared to pay more for it, for sausage, for ham, for good meat. Today, a growing number of Austrian farmers are turning to old animal breeds, such as Mangalitsa and Turopolje pigs. It's a trend that's bringing back new old flavors. The animals are raised for two years, growing slowly with lots of exercise. The result is better quality fat and much tastier meat. Two years seems uneconomical, but closer inspection show the opposite. Sustainable, non-mass production increasingly commands a higher price. Many consumers today are selective. They make their own meals and they buy meat products that are not industrially produced, shopping at small butchers and local stores. We see it in surveys, an interesting development. Consumers may prefer the convenience of the supermarket during the year, but on special days or when they have guests, they'll go to a butcher, because they know that a butcher offers service. He offers quality. He caters for special requirements. Two large schnitzels and a small one. I can do that. If I have a special request, if I want a spicy Leberkäse with extra pepperoni, for example, the small butcher can handle that. He can make me one. And what do Vienna sausages have to do with the Pope? Every year, the city's butchers celebrate Thanksgiving at the Franciscan Church. Recently, a new sausage similar to the Frankfurter was created as a tribute to the order and permission was requested to call it Francis. Permission was granted and a month later a new Pope was elected, Pope Francis.
Everything comes to an end, the performer explains, but not a sausage. It has two ends. So it doesn't matter which end is sliced first, and that has inspired a figure of speech. In Vienna, if something's immaterial, it's said to be wurscht.